Now it is time for some music as we enter the workshop. Now, if we're discussing intelligent life, well, uh, we might talk about uh, uh, about uh, being social and sharing things. So I think we can do a Okay, now hopefully, hopefully the sound level is going to be good for you. Remember, the things that you see in here are different than the things that I see in here as the broadcaster. And really what matters most is what you see in here. I already know what I'm going to talk about, so I might talk to the cats uh, uh, and, and you know, not, not get a reply. But like, I don't need to talk to myself and not get a reply, too. Hi, Rip Artist. Okay, well, thank you for stopping in. All right. So, natural 20s, let's do this. Indeed. Uh, Big Banes, interesting diagram. There will be more, I assure you. Uh, but we are going to discuss the topic of tonight, which is creating intelligent life in your custom world. Now, there is a world that we've been building here as an example, uh, together in chat, with your all's participation and the things that you, you talk about or examples you bring up. I'll also put some things up uh, for vote uh, when we get to that point. This first part, I want to talk about our concept of intelligent life. And in the next part, because this will be a two-part workshop, uh, but then, then, then will we get more diagrams, Matt? Then, <laughs> I don't know if I have a Venn diagram for tonight. Hmm. Uh, we are going to, uh, so we're going to discuss how we understand intelligent life. And that's going to prime us for the second part of our workshop, which is going to be, given what we know about the world we've created, and what are aspects of intelligent life. What kind of intelligent life would we like to make? And the only caveat to that, and I'll repeat it when we get to that point, no humans. And that's not a lol lol, humans are dumb. If we're going to create an original fantasy world, I want it to be fantasy. I don't want humans. I see humans all the time in real life. I talk to them. I'm around them. I am among them. Actually, I even think I have a sound effect for that. It's on uh, it's on one of my uh, my test uh, alert boxes here. I think it's this one. Let's see if I'm correct. By the way, there's an ope for you all. Hey, there's uh, so we have Bane and Big Bane together. The dream team has been assembled, everyone. Also, hi, DQ, if I didn't say that before. So let's, let's have a conversation about intelligent life. At least what we think it is in our real world, so that we can take inspiration from it, and we can... Uh, and we can extrapolate parts that we like into the considerations of our fantasy world. Now, 
The first article I am going to be citing or displaying to you all, the link is right up here in uh, in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Although I, I remember when these were just books. And then it blew my mind once our uh, high school library got entire volumes of encyclopedias on CDs. And there were these cartridges. You actually had to put, push the CD cartridge into the, into the computer. Anyway. Oh, technology. Am I right, everyone? So I think most of us... Uh, I think most of us can... Um, to avoid human, I, I would think we would also want to exclude humanoid. My, 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 again, it, it's, it's like no humans directly, and I would prefer not to have whichever species we want to awaken, uh, just be a human with a silly hat. Um, you know, uh, so if it's slimes, if it's octop, if it's octopus creatures, if you want it to be something more like dwarves, but preferably not dwarves, as we traditionally know dwarves. That's fine, too. And dwarves are humanoid, but they're, they're just a, a different, you know, blend on it, right? Will it blend? I don't know. We'll find out. I just don't want humans or humans with silly hats. Swarves, not dwarves. So how how did we come into being, right? If uh, it, now depending on on your take, if you are uh, if you're for evolution, we're going to be discussing evolution. If you are for a sense of creation, either directly by a divine hand, and of course, for as many beliefs as there are, there are different types of creation stories uh, that exist. Um, you know, then we went from the wind and clay and other things into, so a non-intelligent thing into an intelligent thing. Either process, there was a point in time where we were not intelligent life and then we were intelligent life. Is it as easy to explain as just crossing a line? A line in the sand even, let alone just a hard line, right? It might be more like the heap paradox, H-E-A-P, heap paradox, which in a sense goes, and by the way, we'll be talking about uh, uh, some Greek philosophy here in just a little bit too. If, if I have one grain of salt and I drop it on a table, is that a heap of salt? Probably not. Pro you're right, probably not. Is that fair? Aha! I have another grain of salt, and I drop that second grain onto the table. Now I have two. Is that a heap of salt? All right, hold on. Probably not. I'll tell you what. I'm feeling generous. I'm gonna I'm gonna double that. I'm gonna have four whole grains of salt now on a table. Is that a heap of salt? Well, tell you what, I know. I appreciate you tolerating my, my shenaniganery in exploring this, this process, this heap paradox. We're going to cut to the chase, and I'm going to say 1,000 grains of sand. Will you, will you give me 1,000 grains of sand is a heap? How about dimensional space creatures like the Bagman, Matt? All of them could come from a different pocket dimension. Bet you would love that world. Hey, I in the workshop, my own preferences are not necessarily uh, needing to be enforced. Putting that out there. And now some of you might go, you know what? I'll buy it at a thousand heaps or a thousand grains of salt. That, that right there, that is a heap. You reckon? You can? 
If in a thousand grains of salt ain't a heap, I don't know what in tarnation is. By the way, if anyone's watching this on YouTube in the future, number one, hi. Number two, we were talking about accents or the fact that I have a super neutral Ohio no accent accent. Be well, rep artist. Uh, enjoy Critical Role. Now, I say, I will take your thousand grains of, uh, take your thousand grains of salt, and I'll, I'm going to add, I'm going to add 10,000 grains of salt. Now, that is a heap. If I don't know what a heap is, then I don't know what a heap is. Clearly, now, 11,000 grains of salt is a heap. And then, what I'm going to do is say, nope, we're, we're going to clear out the entire uh, salt section of your local grocery store. Every salt shaker, every box, uh, whether it's uh, it's iodized or kosher or coarse grain or fine or whatever. And, and we're going to pour the entire aisle of salt. That's a pretty good heap, right? You know what I can still do? I could take you down by the lake and I will show you undoubtedly a heap of salt. It is probably it is probably a 70 foot pile of salt stored by the lake here in town uh, to be used during uh, snowstorms and the like. It usually has like a big tarp over it. Now that might just be a heap of salt. Or that actually might be too big. You might go, that's a mountain of salt. That's no heap. Oh, well we overshot it. Well, where's the heap? Where's intelligence? At what point in time? With When we were, uh, you know, the, there's the meme, return to monkey. Where's the point in time where we as monkeys or uh, the clay of the earth went from that to what we consider to be intelligent. Because probably at almost every point along the way, we were always as intelligent as we could be. In D&D &D terms, a monkey, if the monkey's the, if the monkey's it, that's an 18, 20 intelligence, maybe even higher. Because there's no other way to measure it until other ways are made or developed or passed down. So if we read here, if we're talking about uh, human evolution, uh, the process by which human beings developed on Earth from now extinct primates, viewed zoologically, we humans are homo sapiens, a culture-bearing, upright walking species that lives on the ground and very likely first evolved in Africa about 315,000 years ago. We are now the only living members of what many zoologists refer to as the human tribe, Hominini. But there is abundant fossil evidence to indicate that we were uh, preceded for millions of years by other hominins, uh, such as our dip... <clears throat> I was practicing these before too, so I wouldn't stutter, and yet here I am doing it. Artipithecus, Australopithecus, and other species of Homo, and that our species also lived for a time uh, contemporan uh, contempor contemporaneously with at least one other member of our genus, H. Neanderthalus, the Neanderthals. Now, I'm not going to read this entire article to you. There, uh, there are references. I linked it to you, and I'll, I'll do it again. I'm, I'm. I'm desperate enough for you to learn. You can read about this and link out to the origin of species, the descent of man. You can read about, uh, like, so what What are the differences between uh, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals? What is this missing link? We've, we've heard of this before, right? Uh, we've heard of uh, the, the fossils that were found, uh, Lucy, I believe, right? There are, it goes into, uh, into epochs and all kinds of other references, okay? 
about uh, primates and, and would you consider a monkey intelligent? It might be intelligent life, maybe. Though... Is it? Is a monkey? Is an ape? Is a gorilla? Is an orangutan an intelligent animal? A species, more broadly? Do they bear a culture? Behavior, uh, pe uh, culture, behavior peculiar to Homo sapiens, together with material objects used as an integral part of this behavior. Thus, culture includes language, ideas, beliefs, customs, codes, institutions, tools. Now, we could get into our opposable thumbs, but tools, uh, techniques, works of art, rituals, and ceremonies, among other elements. And there's more there to read. Do they have a culture? Is it more in instinct? Just survival? I mean, talk amongst yourselves. I will hopefully continue to address this. As we look at other, um, at, at other sources, especially leaping, uh, you know, taking not just the biological fact, if we're intelligent, we have some sort of brain and ability to process information, which could include our imaginations, as that's where a lot of culture might uh, be rooted, if we're talking about beliefs or other things. Ah, I told you. I told you, but you didn't believe me. We're also going to touch into some Greek culture here, right? Hesiod's Five Ages of Man. Now, these are not ages as a scientific category. This is not a, a clear fossil record. Uh, this is going to be, in a sense, even how you might read about ages in The Lord of the Rings, which takes place in the Third Age and introduces the Fourth Age of Man. If we want to talk about culture and an era of thinking about oneself or about greater things, uh, the origin of, of ph uh, philosophical ideas, and uh, maybe not the origin, but certainly a heavily studied and romanticized era of philosophical uh, contemplation and uh, religion and other things. The classic Greek Five Ages of Man were first written down in an 8th century BCE poem written by a shepherd named Hesiod, who along with Homer was one of the earliest of Greek epic poets. He likely based his work on an unidentified older legend possibly from Mesopotamia or Egypt. Ah, yes, the Fertile Crescent, perhaps the cradle of life uh, on Earth here. Or at least the it provided enough, uh, enough things that we could do more than just survive. More on that in just a little bit. Hold on to that. Man, how do we ever have the luxury to think about things like that? We'll get to it. According to Greek legend, Hesiod was a farmer uh, from the uh, Boeotian region of Greece who was out tending his sheep one day when he met the Nine Muses. The Nine Muses were the daughters of Zeus and Nemesine, divine beings who inspired creators of all kinds, including poets, speakers, and artists. By convention, the Muses were always invoked at the beginning of an epic poem. On this day, the Muses inspired Hesiod to write the 800-line epic poem called Works and Days. In it, Hesiod tells three myths, the story of Prometheus' uh, theft of fire. Have I used that somewhere before? It sounds familiar. I don't know where I've, I've talked about Prometheus. The tale of Pandora and her box of ills, and the five ages of man. The Ages of Man is a Greek creation story that traces the lineage of mankind through five successes ages or races, including the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Age of Heroes, and the Present, to Hesiod, which is the Iron Age. You've probably heard these terms before, 
even if you're not too familiar with uh, with you know our our history, our, our um, you know anthropology, right? This is a lot of other things too, right? Have any of you heard of the Golden Age of Comics, the Silver Age of Comics? And many of you might have heard of, uh, now that that's pop culture, but just look at the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. And we, we come back to pop culture, but in a mythological sense with uh, the different ages in Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, sorry if I missed a little bit on chat here. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm... I'm uh, uh, reading what you're saying. Omniscience. Uh, well, omniscience would be cool, but that might be a little bit more relegated to the supernatural uh, or to the divine, which can work because, well, that was what we had talked about in our last workshop. Uh, possibly, though, is used to describe the difference between man and animal and intellect. Um, hi, Hero Dragon. I love ancient cultures. Nearly cried reading the descriptions of Roman dog statues. Comics, what's that? Uh, I'm loving Night Terrors, says Hero Dragon. Kind of makes you what the wonder what the next age is going to be, right? If, if we're in modern comics, well, modern will always be modern, but what was modern in the 90s? It might not be so modern through uh, the technology to produce the comics, the art styles, uh, the stories that are told, etc. But anyway... So you can read about those ages here as we have this hearkening back. Man, even back in the day, we were we were pining for back in the day. About these origins, about where these things that are around us have have come from, or a languishing of where they're going. The Five Ages of Man is a long passage of continuous degeneration, tracing the lives of men as descending from a state of primitive innocence to evil, with a single exception for the Age of Heroes. Some scholars have noted that Hesiod wove the mythic and the realistic together, creating a blended story based on an ancient tale that could be referenced and learned from. Do you think that uh, any elders in your life, it could be parents or grandparents, or uh, I don't know if any of you work in a medical field, uh, maybe you work, uh, there's a veterans hospital in town here. If you are a, a nurse, a volunteer, a doctor, or even an administrator, and you talk to one of the, the veterans uh, living in the veteran home, you know, they have stories of back in the day, right? The heroes of yore. And back when they were young, they also talked about the heroes of yore. And when those heroes of yore were young, they also talked about their heroes of yore. And this is a way for us to have a culture to pass down through our stories, through being able to imagine uh, uh, something that we do. We create and produce offspring. Well, if we can do it, certainly the gods can. And now we say, well, so if, if the gods are these super concentrated uh, essences of things, then this is how they can interact. Because that's how we also see other things interact. And, you know, we are built of the same stuff as the rest of the, the universe, and the gods are part of the universe. So this is, this is a story as old as time. It, it is a universal thing. It is thematic. And I, I would urge you, Right? If we're talking about the sign of intelligent life, of our own human evolution, is that of culture. Understand some aspects of culture. This is one of many that you can look into. So what are some other what are some other considerations then? Now, as always, this this is Wikipedia. Uh, you can reference it. But uh, if you're if you're writing a report, don't cite this as a primary citation. You can use it for inspiration, though I would urge you to look at other sources and cite those other sources that are referenced even by Wikipedia. 
uh, for the for the sake of presenting uh, the information in succession to you. That's the disclaimer, probably obvious to most, if not all of you. Um, but when we when we talk about something here, intelligence is wisdom intelligence. They're both thinky thoughts, right up here. And first time chatter from uh, Bruble. Hello. I think my DM is going uh, to go to heck dealing with my new character. I've had enough of being the weak character. Uh, so, uh, Bruble, what, what's going on at your table? You are absolutely welcome to share your story. And in fact, if, if we can even use that uh, as a part of our workshop, I let's do that, right? You found a very good place to talk about your character, to talk about what's going on at your tabletop. Share, and you'll probably find, as much as I can, uh, presenting uh, this this concept, you'll also find other people in chat who I'm sure can provide some advice or share stories, too. Because that absolutely is going to lean into what we're talking about here. Wisdom, sapience, sagacity, is the ability to contemplate and act productively using knowledge, experience, understanding, common sense, and insight. Ooh, wow, we're hearing a lot of this. Especially as we do keep talking about this stuff. About welcoming newcomers to the hobby and teaching them from our own experiences. Even the core concept of role-playing games, experience points, right? Even hitting milestones. It's the next age of the story. It's the next turn of it, right? We're a little, we're a little more well-traveled when we go past this next milestone. Ruble says, all I'm going to say is level one peace domain cleric with four levels of chronergy wizard. I don't know what that means mechanically, uh, but I hope you have fun with it, though I will I will caution that uh, contention back and forth can lead to a not fun time if it turns into an arms race of damage output versus hit point pool. And I'm not saying that to lambast you, Brubel. Uh, if there's something that your DM is not picking up or not considering, if your DM is consistently offering you uh, lacking, engaging storytelling or compelling combats that help you feel a part of this world, um, just be careful about the escalation in mechanics or contrivance. And sometimes it might it might be better if you loved the character you're piloting before to just sit down out of character with your DM and say, look, I've not been feeling it these past couple sessions. And I have this new character concept, but... You know, I, it feels like I'm making a character to specifically survive what you're throwing. And that wasn't exactly what I was hoping for when I sat down at this table. But, Brubel, you are welcome to continue sharing, and hopefully we can help you cure uh, what ails you. And offer our own, well, wisdom, sapience, and sagacity. <laughs> wisdom is associated with attributes such as unbiased judgment, compassion... Uh, experiential self-knowledge, self-transcendence, and non-attachment, and virtues such as ethics and benevolence. Wisdom has been defined in many ways, including several distinct approaches to assess the characteristics attributed to wisdom. Now, there are, are definitions. It has been used in various mythologies. I would absolutely encourage you you know, the, the uh, know thyself, right? Um, but what, that is one of the Delphic maxims. I believe we talked about these in a prior workshop as well. Go through and continue reading about this. What is this as a concept? What What is it that would separate uh, a monkey or a dog or an, an, a greater ape or us as a species, as humans, in our wisdom. And where could that wisdom have come from? You know, in many senses, it, it, that might be what is our divine gift. Or it is something that has evolved out of environmental necessity. 
In order to expand and grow, we had to learn that wearing furs kept us warm because we are otherwise quite naked. We are naked apes. Uh, and so if we could continue wearing furs, we could continue pushing north out of the Fertile Crescent, out of um, these very equatorial, you know, in Africa, Middle East, out of these cradles of humanity and civilization and beliefs. So there's a lot here. It gets into uh, religion, uh, like religion and religious concepts on wisdom. If you have an evening, sit down and consider it. Now, we're going to talk also about sentience. Because sapience is not sentience. Hi, Delport. Welcome. Why did we evolve to have less fur, then learn to wear other furs? Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, wh why did we also evolve uh, to have less uh, less pigmentation or epicanthic folds, uh, or uh, some populations not be able to process alcohol uh, or even uh, dairy? Uh, I guess in particular, like milk. As we continued to spread, we adapted, even if the ad adaptations then necessitated our perpetuity with the tools that we had brought with us to these other places. So we brought our environment along with us. We need to stay warm. We brought warmth from a naturally warm place into the cold places. And so because we had that, and we were also exposed to other environmental uh, other environmental uh, conditions. Our core was maintained, but features about us were changed over time. Sentience is the capacity of a being to experience feelings and sensations. The word was first coined by philosophers in the 1630s for the concept of an ability to feel, derived from Latin sentience, feeling, to distinguish it from the ability to think, in other words, to reason, thinking versus feeling. In modern Western philosophy, sentience is the ability to experience sensations. In different Asian religions, the word sentience has been used to translate a variety of concepts. In science fiction, the word sentience is sometimes used interchangeably with sapience, self-awareness, or consciousness. Some writers differentiate the mere ability to perceive sensations such as light or pain and the ability to perceive emotions such as fear or grief. The subjective awareness of experiences by a conscious individual are known as qualia in Western philosophy. Just as with our exploration of wisdom, of sapience, this is another aspect to our, intel our intelligence as a, a broad concept, as a catch-all. Thinking and feeling, reacting, using tools and building culture. Recognition paradox and relation to sapience. While it has been traditionally assumed that sentience and sapience are in principle independent of each other, there are criticisms of that assumption. One such criticism is about recognition paradoxes. One example of which is that an entity that cannot distinguish a spider from a non-spider cannot be arachnophobic. More generally, it is argued that since it is not possible to attach an emotional response to stimuli that cannot be recognized, emotions cannot exist independently of cognition that can recognize. Cognize, right? The claim that precise recognition exists as specific attention to some details in a modular mind is criticized both with regard to data loss 
is a small system of disambiguating synapses in a module physic in a module physically cannot make as precise distinctions as bigger synaptic system encompassing the whole brain. Uh, this is uh, dipping a bit into what many of us might recognize through our pop culture-ness, through our exploration of sci-fi and fantasy in novels and video games and other such things, uh, of an uncanny valley. If you're not familiar with that term, that can be some homework for you to look up what is the uncanny valley. Uh, so sorry, a, a little bit of a derailment there, but there there are some things to consider that might overlap or exclude. Many, not all. Some, but not many, nor all. This is not just a simple Venn diagram, I guess, to go back to what Daly was invoking earlier in chat. Uh, because it is... It is not only individual by individual, it could be species by species, it could be environment by environment, and instead of a nice flat Venn diagram with a two-dimensional overlay, we have this maybe as some core concepts, but then we have a Venn coming in here from a different angle, and it becomes a big 3D jumble of overlapping qualities and some shifting things or unique exceptions to an otherwise norm for a populace of something. Uh, so if you want to read where it crosses over to animals uh, and other such things. Uh, hi, ready to nap. So we're getting an idea of qualities that could make intelligent life. And in fact, let's boil, let's boil this down to a set of mechanics. So I have, I have here the player's handbook. Many of you might be familiar with this book. I, I would imagine so. This is the D&D section of Twitch after all. And many of us, most of us have met through Dungeons and Dragons. How does this rule system, because again, in our workshop, we are building a fantasy world in which we want to run a game. It could be D&D, it could be Pathfinder, it could be Alien RPG, it could be a lot of different things. We're going to use Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition as an example. So, how do they measure intelligence? Measures mental acuity, information recall, analytical skill. Okay, seems... Seems understandable. So what's the difference between intelligence and wisdom when it comes to the mechanics of this game. What is the difference between an intelligent creature in D&D and a wise creature in D&D? Measures awareness, intuition, insight. Oh. So this is probably why a lot of animals in D&D might have a high wisdom but very low intelligence. But what about for things like emotion, like feeling? Well, that does that does come into wisdom, though that could also overlap with charisma. Confidence, eloquence, leadership. It's not just a physical presentation of how hot you are as the bard. Though confidence can also be born from intelligence is often fear is an emotional reaction to a lack of information. You uh, to, to go into the arachnophobia in the article prior, you might uh, have a fear of spiders. And you say one day, you know what? I don't want to be scared of spiders anymore. They're everywhere. This is no way to live. And so you start reading about spiders and you, you discover amazing species of them, the beautiful webs they make, the, the different, uh, you know, how venomous they are. Uh, you read about where they live and how they act. And all of a sudden, you know a lot about spiders. And you say, you know what? It might be creepy. You might still go, ooh, you know, if one kind of, you know, kind of 
came down and it surprised you, right? You weren't ready for it. But now instead of looking at a spider 10 feet away and going, ooh, you might go, well, I'll, I got to take care of that. No, that's not a brown recluse. That No, that's just a, a, a parson spider. I'll get you later. And now whether get you is eliminate or get you is I'll put you in a cup and take you outside. That's for you to decide. But no longer are you going, ah, kill it, kill it, you know, or, or just running away. As we have gone from a lack of information providing an emotional response to maybe you have actually d challenged yourself to read and learn about these creatures. And maybe you say, you know what? Today is the day I am going to my local pet store and I'm buying a pet tarantula. I did my research. Here's a very easy to own tarantula. You put a cricket in it, you know, in the cage once a week. It takes care of itself. You get to look at it. You don't necessarily have to handle it. And maybe your first tarantula is just that. You buy a cricket, you put it in there once a week, you look at it and you say, okay. And then you might go, well, it died. But it was a year old. It was its time or whatever, you know, it, they're all different. And, but I'm going to get another one. But this one, maybe this one eats uh, two crickets. It's a little bit bigger. Looks a little bit meaner, but I, I know it's still a good starter tarantula. It requires a little bit more care. Um, and this time, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to get uh, I'm gonna get one that is uh, that I can hold. You know? And then you try it out. And you get that experience. You build that confidence which is coming from experience, it's coming from intelligence, and it, it blends in. So here, even among the three, uh, the, the mental abilities that we, we tend to call them, right? You have physical abilities and mental abilities. We don't have a clean Venn diagram that is mutually exclusive. We have the two, and then poof, right in the Z-axis. You know, bang, zoom, right to the Z-axis. We, uh, we have these overlaying uh, reductions of our, the concepts in D&D. And you can further see what qualifies as a uh, what qualifies as an intelligent creature, as a a, a a sentient, maybe even a sapient, if you want to use those terms interchangeably. Well, there is a a hard limit in D and D. And for those of you who've played for a while, you might understand that there are some spells that only work uh, to, and, and that might cause an emotional reaction because you know, we get into the whole, remember we are talking about things that don't know about spiders or non-spiders can't be arachnophobic. So there's some illusions that just don't work on creatures with an intelligence lower than three. Awaken is a spell that brings things out of unintelligent creaturehood into intelligent creaturehood. After spending the casting time tracing magical pathways within a precious gemstone, you touch a huge or smaller beast or plant. The target must have either no intelligence score or an intelligence of three or less. The target gains an intelligence of ten, which for any point in time in a D&D &D game, whether it's Bronze Age, Iron Age, or futuristic D&D, ten is your average, maybe you just, uh, you just uh, graduated high school. Maybe not with honors, uh, you know, maybe, you know, D is for diploma, graduate high school, but there you go. And so here we have a hard mechanic of what is an intelligent creature. It's four or higher in D&D. &D. See, we're all talking about gnomes in chat, right? After Fof says, that actually happened to me with spiders. Used to be terrified of spiders. Now I love them. Uh, Bane says, I hate the ocean, but I like sharks. I would never own a tarantula, but I photograph spiders. So let's, let's see a very common interpretation of this dawning of intelligence uh, in life. Okay. This is probably a very familiar clip to many of you.
I know it says it down there because I couldn't clip it out, but if you haven't seen this movie... And I hope that that sudden cut did offer you something visceral. And that you understood what the point of these scenes are together. Could you deny that this is a sign of intelligent life? Listen to the music. The space station spinning to create an artificial gravity, right? This creation of the Earth sent up into the heavens. Hi, JK Hunter. Thank you for joining us. And yet, is this intelligent life, everyone? You're, you're welcome to share your opinion. Hi, Tony. Is this intelligent life? Hmm. What happened here? If it's, if it's undeniable to us with modern sensibilities that this is intelligent life, Based on the things we've discussed, could this qualify, I wonder? It looks like we have families or tribes that have gone to war. One charges, the other holding a bone. And what happens? They're communicating. They're using tools. It might have been an accident, but after seeing the one, after seeing the one, the others have joined in the tool use and are making an example of the attacker. And what comes of this? The leader, the leader of the tribe, the smartest, the most adept, the hero of everyone in this society. And has reached a point of cultural significance. Look, quiet everyone, quiet. I am the leader. And yet for this, a cry of victory, using intelligence and emotion, feeling something, defeating the enemy, knowing that one is safe. And is living in such luxury, knowing that he is supported by the rest of the tribe. 
he tosses aside that tool. That this here is the cutting, bleeding edge of society. This tool right here is the scientific advancement that is going to lead to the safety and security of our entire population. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Now, speaking of bones, and in fact, let's uh, I'll, I'll turn on some some space like music as we enjoy our high level of intelligence in the cutting bleeding edge of the world. A healed femur is the earliest sign of true civilization. This is a uh, now. Th this is a uh, a looking into right. Is it apocryphal? To whom uh, should it be credited? It, it's it, that's not the point I want to get across. I want to get across what was said. Early in my career, I heard a lecture from the anthropologist Margaret Mead. What would you say is the earliest sign of civilization? And civilization, I think, is a mark of an intelligent species. Now, the advancement of it, do they have electricity? Are they working with bronze or steel or iron or stone or whatever? It's still a civilization. And there in the heat paradox, we don't know where it happened, but it finally became the heat. Uh, what would you say is the earliest sign of civilization? Uh, she asked, naming a few options. A clay pot, tools made of iron, the first domesticated plants. These are all early signs, she continued. But here is what I believe to be evidence of the earliest true civilization. <laughs> And playing music, everyone. Welcome to Coffee Cat Presents. Welcome, Coffee Cat and uh, and crew. In from Rebirth, a D&D &D tale. Uh, welcome, Raiders. Uh, let's get you a quick shout-out. Civilization started with jazz, says After. By the way, Awkward Mancer, hello. Thank you for joining us. Shout-out. Coffee Cat Presents. And shout-out. Coffee Cat Presents. Thank you for coming over, everyone. And hello again, Woden. Uh, wouldn't call real apes unintelligent. They know tools and travel in troops, can communicate, even fight over land. But we seem to have more control over basic instincts. And and there's studies into the, into not not necessarily the great apes there, but uh, bonobos as well. Though that that's more applied to examples in human sexuality, or what could be, uh, or our feelings of control. Uh, and how about the flower waltz being a sign of sentience instead? So welcome. Uh, so we're, uh, she was talking about, uh, so what is the sign of civilization? A clay pot, tools made of iron, the first dom domesticated plants. These are all early signs, she continued. But here is what I believe to be evidence of the earliest true civilization. High above her head, she held a human femur, the largest bone in the leg and pointed to a grossly thickened area where the bone had been fractured and then solidly healed. 
such signs of healing are never found among the remains of the earliest, fiercest societies. In their skeletons, we find clues of violence, a rib pierced by an arrow, a skull crushed by a club. So we're talking about tool use, maybe hunting in packs, land control, these sort of things, right? But this healed bone shows that someone must have cared for the injured person, hunted on his behalf, brought him food, served him at personal sacrifice. And to this, uh, to this, uh, uh, to Dr. Mead here. She said, you knew that an ancient people had reached the point of becoming a true society whenever she found a healed femur. In other words, the first step to civilization is an act of human compassion and it becomes the foundation to all the great achievements of humankind. So, it's not just tools. It's not just a, uh, a pack or a clan or a group or a tribe. If you have reached a point where you can care for other people, you are you are an intelligent species you are intelligent life and this if you want to read more about the quote anyway there's that aha you knew it was coming i told you be ready for it to be able to afford such luxuries as thinking as, as thinking about things other than sheer survival. We have a, uh, a concept called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. At its core, and obviously there's exceptions, there's other ways you can look at it, this is a model I'm presenting for consideration, okay? Is this the end-all be-all? No, but it could be a good start and it could lead you to other, other considerations. The higher up you go, well, it's built on everything below it. You need everything else below it to be able to do the thing above it. In order to have a sense of family or property you need to be able to breathe to eat to drink water sex here is for the purpose of reproduction this is survival of the species sex okay there's nothing necessarily romantic about it uh, there's nothing necessarily emotional about it uh, and it could be beautiful. It could also be not beautiful. Sleep. Homeostasis. And excretion. You gotta pee and poo. Homeostasis. Oh. Like when we move north from the equator and it's not as naturally warm... So we need to create warmth to carry with us. So we're always warm. And so we wear furs or we invent clothing. We have homeostasis either given to us by our environment or we act as that as the priority in order to keep this sameness, the necessity.
And if you have those things secured, what are some other things that you can then afford, right? If your basic metabolic and reproductive purposes as an individual or species are taken care of, what can you hope to afford to think about next? A family? You know, uh, your tribe, your unit? If you're starving, you might do something desperate that's not exactly family friendly. But if you're, if you're taking care of, you have food, you have water, you can actually invest in your family. Have a security of yourself because now you've controlled yourself and you want to perpetuate that. You get that going? Now we can worry about... Um, I'm sorry, that's like security of the family. Uh, fa family as a love or belonging is the next stage up. This is... It, I want my family to continue and I'm going to eliminate all threats to it. And if you eliminate the threats, then we can worry about actually, you know, getting along with your family members. Now here at the third tier, this is where we get uh, more than just survival feelings. You know, th this is more, this is physiological. These are like survival feelings. This is safety. This now we can actually do things like, well, you know what? There's no other uh, tribes or species or whatever raiding into us. I can actually develop bonds because I can develop them with friends. I can make friends. I can develop bonds, generational or otherwise, with other tribes, with other families, within my own. And here we actually get to do something like enjoy sexual intimacy, not the bare bones survival of the species, reproduction. We're talking about you actually can now afford to have feelings about uh your mate or mates right and once this is developed and you say you know what i i'm feeling a little bit more fulfilled i'm safe i have water to drink self-esteem confidence achievement respect of others and respect by others well if you're the king of a land and you have food brought to you I mean, you're at the top of the pyramid, right? You actually can afford to feel good about yourself or pat yourself on the back for inventing the army. Now, a lot of other people in your kingdom might be operating here. And so any sense of respect is really out of... I don't respect you necessarily, but I need you to be safe. Or I need you so that I can, I can sleep and not be stabbed in my sleep. So that may not always go up, but to that individual, to the king, it's good to be the king, as Mel Brooks said in uh, History of the World Part One. You actually can afford the time, the resources, the energy to feel good about yourself because you are not scraping to survive because there's no water in a desert or whatever. Now that you can actually afford to feel good about yourself, what can you, you can look outwards, right? You, you, me, we're fulfilled. Now that we've had ours, we've affixed our own oxygen mask. Now we can help others affix their oxygen mask. We can think, we can theorize about morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem solving. This is where we get to kings, uh, fa heads of family, judges, uh, you know, uh, priests or other high-ranking religious officials. Because those very few people have everything else that can qualify up. And they can turn that outwards as the great thinkers, as the great uh, philosoph uh, philosophers. They can turn that outwards to then try and get other people uplifted. Because now you can actually afford to give a damn about the why the moon has phases when you are not starving to death. And you know that the time spent looking at the moon can get passed on to the next generation in your family. And that people care about you enough to let you occasionally look at the moon and wonder why does it get light and dark? What What's up with that? 
then to feel good about your, you know, the conclusions you're coming to or the direction you're going. And your, your shows of thoughtfulness that other people can't afford to do can, can bring a sense of respect or fulfillment. And then boom, there you are. You are, you've invented something to watch the moon or you've actually had the time and the luxury to take fruit or like uh, an orange and a walnut. I mean, presuming those grow there, right? And a candle. Oh my gosh. We can afford to waste a candle? Presuming that was invented by someone? And put the candle here and the orange here and the walnut here. Oh, I get it. Of course. It's the shadow of the orange, which is the big thing. And we live on a big thing, and that's a small thing. I'm going to call that the moon, and I'm going to call this the earth. So that way we can at least identify these concepts and pass those on into future generations. Hi, coffee. We're having a very cool, uh, we're having a very cool workshop. I mean, in my humble opinion, <laughs> uh, for moving into behavioral biology next, I highly recommend, uh, Sapolsky's Stanford course on YouTube, uh, invention of calendar and math says awkward man, sir. And Ravenstar joins us now. Now, uh, I, I'm going to conclude as we've, we've talked about different cultures. We've talked about levels of intelligence or compassion about storytelling and passing on things through generation. Um, if you, if you have a familiarity, uh, with Abrahamic religion, then this might be something you already know, or if you only know the story, uh, in the religious books that you read, this might be an interesting expansion to that. If you play Vampire the Masquerade, you might go, interesting. Because, of course, I have my own, my own take on that, too. So I want to conclude this part of the workshop by going over... By going over this threshold. What, what is the heap? What is the difference? What is something that we can at least identify, if not as spider or everything that's not... Like, spider or not spider? What is a sentience or sapience or good and everything not good? The story of Cain and Abel is the next major story in the Bible after the creation account and the story of the Garden of Eden. In short, Cain murders his younger brother Abel. I'm sorry, spoilers, everyone. I should have put a spoiler warning up, but you know, now you know. In short, Cain murders his younger brother Abel and is exiled for his crime. But the story is just a moral tale. Or might it be an attempt to explain something deeper about the development of human civilization. Let's take a closer look at the story of Cain and Abel. Before we come to the analysis, here's a brief summary of what we're told in the book of Genesis. After God expels them from the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve knew each other. In other words, they, they had sex. It was the biblical no. And Eve conceived a child. This child was Cain, their firstborn son. They then have a second son, Abel, we are told that Abel was a shepherd or keeper of sheep, while Cain was a farmer or tiller of the ground. One day, Cain brought uh, some of the crops he had grown and presented them to God as an offering. Abel also brought an offering, the firstlings of his flock of sheep. But whilst God is pleased with Abel's gift, he is less than pleased with Cain's. Cain grows angry and downcast, and God tells him that if Cain strives to do well, he will be accepted by God. So the crops, we're to assume, don't matter. It's striving to be a good person and do good deeds that will lead to God's acceptance. But this incident seems to have had an effect on Cain, because one day when he was in the field with Abel, he rose up against his brother and killed him. When God came to Cain, he asked where his brother was, and Cain responded uh, truculently, Am I my brother's keeper? Which is no way to speak to God, surely. 
Anyway, it didn't matter because God knows everything, and he could hear the voice of Abel's blood crying to him from the ground, where Cain had presumably buried him. God cursed Cain for his crime and told him that his crops would fail as punishment. He would become a fugitive on the run and a vagabond, a beggar. Cain cannot bear such a punishment and fears that anyone who sees him and learns what he did will seek to kill him. So God set a mark upon him, the so-called Mark of Cain, which ensured that if anyone did take vengeance into their own hands and kill him, they would have God's vengeance delivered upon them seven times worse. Cain left the field and went to live in the land of Nod, which was on the east of Eden. Nod is from the Hebrew meaning wander, symbolizing the fact that Cain had now become a wanderer or nomad. The idea of the land of Nod denoting the realm of sleep appears to have been based on a pun on to nod off, meaning to fall asleep. The earliest reference to land of Nod, meaning sleep, is in the work of Jonathan Swift. At some point, Cain got married and his wife conceived a son, Enoch. He built a city and named it Enoch after his son. The rest of Genesis chapter 4 details the descendants of Cain. So there's a clear indication that whoever wrote the story of Cain's killing of Abel was not the same person who wrote the accounts of the creation and the fall. If we read the first three chapters of the book of Genesis, we learn that Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel are the only four people in the world at this point. Yet Cain tells God that everyone uh, that findeth me shall slay me. So who then are these other people Cain is worried about, and where did his wife come from? In other words, the Cain and Abel story probably originated in a separate source from the story of Adam and Eve, but was grafted on later with the inconsistencies in the two stories left unresolved. So these two accounts must belong to different traditions. But what does the story mean? It's often taken to be an injunction against murder, but that doesn't get us very far beyond a fairly self-evident moral point. I think it's pretty obvious. The clue to the deeper meaning of the story of Cain and Abel perhaps rests on two aspects of the narrative. The offering to God which Cain produces and God is displeased with, and the clues provided by the etymologies of the two brothers' names. Let's begin with the incident involving the offerings of the fruits of the field, i.e. Cain's crops and Abel's sheep. Cain's crops are deemed unsatisfactory by God, while Abel's sheep are received enthusiastically. This has been analyzed as a reference to God's preference for animal sacrifice as an offering, but it may also allude to the wretched life to which a particular group was reduced when their crops failed, and they were forced to make a living by doing smith work for the other tribes. The Dictionary of the Bible even points to sources which tell us that certain castes were forbidden to keep cattle. We can see how this would lead to the resentment of other castes who could do so and profited as a result. But a clue to the origins of the Cain and Abel story might also lie in the symbolic meanings of the brothers' two names. Cain is from a root word meaning forge or smith, and is cognate with the Arabic Cain, which means the same thing. In Genesis uh, 4.22, we learn that Tubal Cain was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, which lends credence to this etymology. Tubal was a district in Asia Minor in what is now Turkey. Meanwhile, Abel is believed to be derived from Jubal or Jabal, the ancestor of nomadic shepherds. If we put these two names together, we find that Cain represents the farmer and the skilled artisan, while Abel represents the herdsman or the nomad. And this will go into the Bronze Age, Iron Age, right, as, the, as these things were starting to be written and put down. And this is coming to a point but it seems more likely that these early stories from Genesis, both of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, are less about the beginnings of mankind than about the development of civilization during the Age of Agriculture. Where Cain and Abel is a story written perhaps just after the time period, hearkening back to a golden age, right? The Garden of Eden. God was pleased with us. Everything was beautiful and perfect. And then we enter a Silver Age, and then a Bronze Age. Until we get to modernity, not maternity, but I mean, that that's what brings us, you know, 
every generation closer. M modernity, modern, modern times when this story, when these stories were originally written. Cain and Abel is a tale, an allegory of hunter gatherers living in the wilds off of everything God provides the land itself. You eat what's available, you travel, you see the world that has been created for you. If there's a berry, you pick it and eat it. Cain is the artificer, artifice, is the metal worker, the miner, the one who tears down the mountains, the one who, who he himself guides and directs the plants and animals. Welcome, TT2KB, Debbie Snacks, it is excellent to have you here again. Welcome uh, to our friends from Tabletop to Keyboard. If you're wondering what TT2KB stands for, it's a pleasure to have you here in the workshop. And thank you for the shout outs to our rating friends. Welcome everyone, I hope that you had a, uh, a good game of Pathfinder. And so here we have a modern tale hearkening back to when mankind went from hunter-gatherers. We ate what was around, we saw what there was to see, and we were we were a part of the land by living off it and subjected to it. To now taking those forces of nature and domesticating uh, herds, dogs, by domesticating plants, by no longer uh, you know, drifting and, and seeing the lands that have been made for you, but you destroy the mountain because it's in your way. You build a thing that you want. You breed an animal you want. You make the plants you want. And so you'll travel 100 miles that way, get their seeds, and take the plants 100 miles back to grow in your backyard for your consumption. And maybe not even for the consumption of other people. Or if you are sharing, uh, it's, it is perhaps through... Uh, the cultural connections or economics or other things. And this could this could be seen as that story of God is angry with people who are taking over these roles. And so there you go. As a, a, a wrap up going back into the various ages into uh, you know of course we had the bones here. Now, none of these are a, uh, a, a donkey's jaw, uh, an ass's jaw. But we do see brother killing brother with bones. And it goes back into security and safety. We could do things other than just, you know, live a, a content but harsh life. You know, it, it's, it's what, what's the quote from the Ohio farmer that recently passed away? It's, uh, it's fair work, like it's tough but, but honest work. Which is also why you tend to see a lot of people living out in the countryside, in rural areas, as farmers or other workers of the land. They do tend to be more religious or spiritual, or at least have a connection and an understanding with the land that they work, an appreciation of it and for it. And once a society gets to a particular point where we have that first person who now can afford to look outside of himself. Because all of this is personal. And now that we've been realized, we can actually give a poop about someone else and about other, other things that maybe don't even affect us, but could. We can entertain the things that possibly don't even exist. And do that as a, if not just as a form of survival of understanding how lightning forms, but as entertainment through the stories passed down through cultures and families and generations through Hesiod and Homer and other, uh, other people from all different parts of the world and cultures through oral tradition or those written down in clay tablets on paper that survived 
um, you know, various, like, the graffiti of Pompeii that's discovered. So now that we have an idea of what intelligent life can be, let's take a quick break. I'm going to get up and refresh myself. And when we come back, I want to take considerations like this. And with your help, let's create intelligent life. You know, as per our schedule here. What are we doing? We are creating early intelligent life. And then tomorrow, we're going to create culture from this species that we are uplifting, that we are awakening. So hold on tight, everyone. I'll be back in five, no more than ten minutes, depending on how long I talk to one of the cats who inevitably has something to say to me. And uh, when we come back, I want your all's insight, your help in creating a non-human intelligent species on our fantasy planet. So I'll see you soon, everyone. <laughs>